Welcome to the South by Southwest panel with correspondents from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. We're calling this The Daily Show News Team content from their couches. Uh, I, I really don't want to know whether or not they're actually on their couches. We're just going to assume. And we've got an all-star panel here with Desi Lydic, uh, Jordan Klepper, Michael Costa, Dulce Sloan, and Roy Wood Jr. Now, Ronnie Chang was supposed to be with us, but he's like filming a Marvel movie or doing something way cooler and couldn't join us. So I'm just happy to have the B team here. Thanks, guys, for <laughs> joining us. We really wow. appreciate it. I'm in I have a major, major part in Justice League, but nobody saw it. I just, I just wanted to start with it by giving you guys some, some, uh, some mess. So, so. disrespectful. We, we have you guys, and thank you so much for joining us. So as we film this, Donald Trump, he's lost re-election. He's on trial in the Senate for uh, impeachment, for insurrection. Can we just say job well done? Are we done? Can we can we just leave now? Is it all over? <laughs> Never all done. It's all solved and now we can walk away. That's like clapping right after the hurricane leaves town. There's still cleanup to be done. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> we got the cleanup crew that's got to come in. But but seriously, I guess everybody's trying to figure out, and it seems kind of early to ask this, but how a comedy's gonna change now that we have somebody who's sane in the White House. Do you have any sense now in the, in the early days how things might be different uh, under a Biden administration and with, with Trump out of the White House? There is a misconception that you can't do comedy without Donald Trump as president. The comedy was alive well before him and will be alive well after him. In fact, if anything, we have to mine deeper and harder. And it isn't all just low hanging tweets. That, that, would, that would be my short answer. Yeah, you know, I, I was just going to say it, it was almost more challenging in the sense that, like, you know, our job is to sort of satirize the news and politics. And it's really hard to kind of like parody a parody when you get so absurd. Like, where do you even go from that? How do you heighten from the craziness? So I'm kind of looking forward to things being a little bit a little more normal. Let's hope. Well, I always thought that was kind of insulting when people would say, oh, you know, it just writes itself. No, it, it doesn't write itself. <laughs> Not even with Trump, right? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I, I remember the time before Trump, uh, hundreds of years ago. And, <laughs> and I think you would approach stories from a comedic perspective. One, do I care about this? And two, am I able to do something with this comedically? You had to choose. And then Donald Trump comes in. And he chose the news for us. And so I, I look back to getting back to a, a little bit of a position of, of deciding what it is we want to actually weigh in on and what it is we actually have something to say about. I think that's actually really freeing and exciting for a comedian because there are only so many Donald Trump jokes you can make. I mean, it's in the millions, but we... <laughs> But there's only so it's a finite resource. Now, now Eric, Eric, I, I just for a second, I hate to interject here, Eric. I want you to remember that you're getting that information from one of the correspondents who has always been face to face with the Trump supporters pretty much since <laughs> midterms, if I'm not mistaken. And it just sounds like the voice of a man that's scared and tired of being out there and you know at the MAGA fest. But yeah, you know, to, yeah. Continue, yeah, to be Clinton. clear, if, if you want to know what it's gonna be like after Donald Trump, I literally was at an insurrection traveling around with four bodyguards. So I'm hoping comedy in the era <laughs> beyond Donald Trump, less bodyguards. Uh, I, I mean, I'd love a rubber chicken gag. That would like, I, I'd freaking I'd frickin love it. Just don't make me debate with QAnon supporters about the end of the world. That's that's all I'm asking. Yeah, I was hoping you would get hazard pay, dude. I, I don't know. Me, me too. <laughs> no, I, you know, uh, Viacom tells me the checks in the mail. They've been telling me that for years. So I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure they will really take care of. Uh, uh, I, I'm just, I'm just hoping this health insurance thing Democrats push for really uh, pays off in the Biden administration. You call Viacom for the check. They say it's over at CBS. You call CBS. They say it's over at Viacom. <laughs> <laughs> if they're not doing that now, Rest assured, they're going to do it after they see yeah. this. So, um, I, I know, I know it's early days uh, again. But um, do you have any any sense about how comedy might be different uh, in the post Trump era? Has he ch has he changed us in a way that even though he's not setting the news agenda, the way we talk about this stuff is going to be different? I think people want us to think that things are going to be different, but the formula of comedy hasn't changed. The structure of comedy hasn't changed to the point where things are going to become brand new. Right. So 
you know, now it's we're just going to be making jokes about another old white man who's the president. <laughs> it's, except this one's not trying to kill everybody. So I think the only big difference is going to be it's that Trump was a reality, you know, name, reality star. Because like in the grand scheme of things, we shouldn't have even known who he was. He sold real estate and had businesses. There's plenty of people that do that in New York and nope, and their name isn't on buildings. We don't know nothing about him. He wanted to shine. He wanted to get on. He wanted everybody to know who he was. And now you're down as the only president who's been impeached twice. So congratulations. But when it comes to comedy, the structure of comedy, the bones of comedy hasn't changed. It's just now we don't have to talk about this man who was taking up so much bandwidth because that's what he wanted. Now it's, you know, like Desi was saying, he was a parody of a parody. And now it gives us the opportunity to really just do the parody because then, because everything was before was we had to reverse engineer what he was doing. Because like, well, this is outrageous. Yeah. How do we make this look normal to then make it funny? Now it's oh, this is regular. Let's just make it funny. So if anything, we don't have to deal with this nonsense anymore. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I do think there's like a, a a conversation that I know I'm having with producers in the field and other writers and other correspondents is like in this period of time, we do talk a lot more now about how much publicity we might want to give something that, that there is, even though we're here to tell jokes and we're here to shine a spotlight on issues, like, is there a responsibility in talking a lot about QAnon or talking about like, should we be giving certain subjects PR? Is there, is there a balance? Is there like a, a way to do that in a funny way without necessarily like heightening the movement or the momentum of something like that? You know, those are, and, and I don't, I don't have an answer for it, but there's certainly conversations that we're having in this new era now. That's, and that's interesting to me because like, that's a conversation you'd expect to have like at a news outlet. <laughs> that's, a, that's a conversation <laughs> you would expect like CNN or NPR to be having. Like, I always thought your guys' job was just to tell jokes, but it's interesting yeah. that you that you take on that responsibility and worry about giving QAnon or giving uh, Trump because that's what that's what everybody's asking us journalists. Um, can't you ignore Trump now that he's out of the White House? I think we start with what we care about, and uh, it's very hard to shoot down a pitch, even though it happens every day, uh, if the correspondent or the producers are passionate about it. So there are always jokes to be found. I mean, maybe not every piece uh, you can find jokes. It's too serious or too sad. It's kind of like what Klepper was saying, now that Trump is gone, it is kind of nice because we can pitch a little bit more about what we care about as opposed to just reacting to the headline or the tweet. Yes. I, I also think, uh... I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Trump is gone. Trumpism is here. Like even today, the news today is people arguing about how an insurrection didn't matter and you can't hold him accountable. In fact, the Senate is not going to hold him accountable. Uh, and they just gave half a, an entire party gave a pass to a QAnon spewing a uh, lunatic in the house who says there's space lasers starting wildfires. Like that's <laughs> happening today. So just because Donald Trump's gone, that's, that's that's out there. I think we talk about, you know, following going out on the road and talking to other folks. And you might not be talking to Trump supporters. You're now talking to future House candidates and other people that have now been infected by this, been given this misinformation and are now attempting to uh, be a part of the culture in a different way. And so there might be less of a focus on Donald Trump, but that doesn't mean the militias aren't uh, going anywhere. It doesn't mean the power of places like the Oath Keepers isn't going to pop up and affect folks. It doesn't mean Josh Hawley is any more of a piece of shit. And I think because of that, comedy will rise. The show changed a lot, obviously, when the lockdowns happened and everyone had to work from home. Uh, we could see on the screen what that was like for, for Trevor. Uh, but what was it like for you guys when the show, uh, when we had the lockdowns, everybody had to work from home and you had to figure out how to make things happen in a different way? I think the main thing was the tech aspect of it because it was all right we're going to see you these lights we're going to see you these phones and da, 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 da. because like Desi will tell you that somehow <laughs> she connected her iPhone because they sent us iPhones to film on because they're the easiest to maneuver 
Right. So Desi somehow connected her personal iPhone <laughs> to the work phone, and then somehow Costa connected his phone to some work account. So then Des, so he was getting like pictures of Desi's son, and now Costa <laughs> knows when Desi's parents' anniversary is. Yeah, so, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's this whole work life balance. There's, oh there are God. no boundaries anymore. I think beyond the tech. Eric was figuring out the performance within this mm. box right. and how as a correspondent, we have certain comedic tools and you start, you, you understand how much being in the room with this person helps to create some of the tension or some of the awkwardness and you lose that on zoom. So right. it was figuring out ways literally in how to work. How do you go through this conversation in a way that's still funny and tracks when all you're seeing is this and you start figuring out ways to kind of walk out of frame and you know, I don't want to give away all the tricks, but <laughs> we over time started learning that. And then, you know, we was like, well, you know what, if I could do that, then maybe I could put up a green screen. Can you put, hey, send everybody green screens. And then Jabuki is giving us references of microphones and condensers and sound dampeners. So it's definitely been building, building the plane in the air, but you know, Thankfully, everybody started out at the same place. In a nutshell, it took a global pandemic to get actors to actually appreciate the tech. <laughs> right. I will say I have never had more respect for our crew and how many people it takes to put together a TV show. I mean, it is it's so hard. That's so funny because now that I'm doing it, I've never had less respect for us. <laughs> <laughs> So when Michael drops out a frame, <laughs> yeah, just exactly. know that somebody unplugged something because they got upset. <laughs> there are huge hurdles technically. There's also huge hurdles emotionally. I mean, we are in our homes. I don't want to show everybody my bedroom. I don't want to show people where I eat dinner with my family. Um, right. Well, especially you know, after that, after that bit that Dulce did, where she was looking at everybody's backgrounds. Man, I'm I'm afraid. <laughs> totally. I'm afraid That's for you to I even mean. see. <laughs> I mean, obviously you read, but I can variously see a book that says race baiter. So that's my that's I, my book, by the way. I'm sure yeah. I knew that available it was. in stores Eric. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, I zoom with my friends back home and in Michigan, and their background is a pool or a tree. In LA, they got like avocados behind. Them. I mean, this is New York. Like we're all in tiny apartments with 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 families, and it's it's brutal. You want a tiny apartment? I live in Queens. Yeah. <laughs> we'll say and I live together in Queens. So. But your wife is proud, unless I'm a yeah, sister wife, you ain't in here. Um, that yeah, sounds yeah, like I, an 86. It is. <laughs> Costa's absolutely right, because I was shooting for something, and they're like, oh, well, can you shoot somewhere else in your house? And I was like, no. <laughs> this is my house. You get to see this. Many people have asked me, is that a bathroom curtain? Uh, do, bitch, does this look like a bathroom to you? What are you talking about? You don't just have a shower curtain. Don't play yourself like that. But it, it has been a lot of... Uh, I would pay money things. to see that conversation in full. What, what <laughs> this is a bathroom about? curtain? <laughs> you out your mind. This, this, is, this is fresh from Amazon. Don't play yourself like that. Uh, I made this terrarium. So that's been the main thing. It's because I would always, I always talk to crew because I always want to know what's like, I'm like, what's this? What's this do? How you hold this mic? What's going on? Mm. And for me to be in here doing this on my own, I'm like, listen, I didn't go to school for this. I'm a theater major. I have a degree and none of this stuff is happening right here. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't sign up for that. I'm talented. I'm supposed <laughs> to walk in, you mic me, and then I sit. And that's, that's, that's what she came for. That's what she was born to do. All this other stuff, it's been, it's been a lot. I mean, I'm, I was glad to learn it. Um, because I know all the technicalities, tech durations, but girl, she's done. Unless y'all gonna start sending somebody over here, I get a man. But other than that, <laughs> it is. It's a it's a full on family affair. My my husband is like often holding the camera. I'm like prying the scooter from my five year old's hands so that I can set up a dolly shot. Like we are. It is all hands on deck at all times. So it's uh, yeah, we're we're definitely learning all angles of it. 
and after the lockdown happened and you guys were um, forced to work from home, they tacked an extra 15 minutes on the show. So like, was that, was that, <laughs> were, did you welcome <laughs> that? Cause maybe you might get more bits on or, or did that make it even tougher because you, you've got more time to fill now? It's not one. It's not tougher because a lot of that 15 minutes goes to Trevor being able to go deeper into being Trevor and exploring the conversations with with the guests and it, it, it you can tell you can just watch the interviews in the 30s versus the 45s and trevor is really pursuing his curiosities with the guests the thing is that as we got better at this the time and i know costa can vouch for me on this where the time the turnaround time from idea to conception to edit to from conception to air got shorter and shorter and shorter. It would be on Monday. Can you shoot this Thursday? What type of equipment do you have? And somewhere around November, December, it was, yeah, we're gonna shoot this tomorrow. Now, you might get a, you might be emailed a script at 10 in the morning that shoots at one that's on the show that night and wow. figure it out. I know your babysitter is hiding in Canada till they can get the <laughs> vaccine. So you've got to bribe your child and, you know, Costa and Klepper are in a different situation because they have infants that don't understand English yet. So I'd say with the 45, the show is now reverting creatively back to what it was when it was in studio, where we could be a little bit more reactive to news in the immediate. But because we have the tech figured out, we know how to do everything now. So now it's it's tougher in a sense that things can spring up on you and you're still juggling your regular life while that stuff is happening. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Look, as as one of many correspondents, I think we all welcome the idea that there'd be more show and more opportunity for our pieces to be a little bit longer. Prior to 45 minutes, there was a 30 minute show, but there was a lot of stuff that landed on the cutting room floor. So we can extend some of that stuff now. People are all at home trying to watch content. So 45 minutes is good if they consume more of the daily show uh and roy's right as we got better i mean nothing phases this show and i don't say that as i'm part of that when they said that that this show was going to go on despite the pandemic i thought everybody was insane i thought the executive producers <laughs> had lost their mind how can we possibly do that i don't even know if i have skype <laughs> you know it 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 all yeah. seems impossible and yet they took two days off three days off of air and we were the first ones out airing, broadcasting the show immediately. And that's a testament to the staff, <laughs> the, the leaders, and also Trevor, who's like, why are we stopping? Let's keep going. And I I was reluctant at first and then seeing how they did it and they nothing phases them. They just kept going. There's not enough credit given to the folks who, who are constantly creating around The Daily Show. Like the correspondents, the writers, obviously Trevor, like Trevor, give him space and he fills it with his curiosity and, uh, and his intellect. And so I think that is a, a, such a sweet spot. We have a digital team that is, uh, that is constantly creating things 24-7, uh, pulling things together, old clips, making new ideas, uh, pulling things from the show, adding things to the show, a field department that has had to figure out how to make stuff work in somebody's apartment, but also how to reinvent so that doesn't get boring with green screens to see what like constantly working with uh, CDC uh, requirements to see where we can shoot, uh, how to travel to those places, how to like even a few field shoots we're able to do. I had to do a field shoot that I could only talk to humans if there was a body of water between us. And so I literally interviewed people <laughs> between boats. And, and I do think like that is the spirit of this show is we're gonna make TV tonight out of whatever happens today. Get the smartest people you can. They're all gonna wear a bunch of hats. Uh, it's, you're not just somebody who does one thing on The Daily Show, you do a bunch of things. And, and so I do think that's part of the reason this show has thrived during this, because it's asked of everybody, like wear a bunch of hats, be as creative as you can and work fast. And luckily that's been the job from, since day one. Well, Jordan, I, I wanted to ask you in particular, I mean, you, you've crafted this space where you're going out and talking to the Trumpists, you're, you went to the attack on the Capitol. Uh, we just saw this piece where you talked to some of the people who are still out there. Um, is this Comedy Central's way of getting rid of you <laughs> to send you out in a pandemic to talk to so them? You know what? I, they, you know, I, they, they can't get rid of me. They've tried to cancel me. You know, uh, Literally. Uh, I, their, their, their website has made it really easy to attempt to erase me. But uh, <laughs> luckily, uh, 
I'm I, I am here to stay, baby. Send me right. out in the middle middle of COVID to a bunch of Trumpists, uh, and I will come back with some content. I, I tell you that much. I mean, I do. I, I mean, I love seeing you sort of interact with these people. But um, is there is there a danger in sort of having too many pieces where you know the the focus of it is look look at how crazy these people are because that I just I can't believe how crazy these people are. It's it's wild to see the way folks react. But to be honest, like that is that that. I think if people are shocked at what happened on January 6th, we've been chronicling that since day one. I do think like right. what I am proudest of is like, we go there. No offense to any other late night shows, but they weren't at the Capitol when it was being attacked by insurrectionists. And, and talking to folks who I'd seen at other rallies, talking about the same BS that they pushed there. Why are they pushing it there? Because the strongest and most powerful man on earth is giving them permission to do that. And so I do think like, it's been scary since day one. And, you know, there's always the conversations about like, what are we giving air to and what have you? I think when I'd go to those rallies, it wasn't us just trying to find the dumbest thing being said. What we were tapping into is what was being said at those rallies. Like, these are the conspiracies that are going on. These are the, the mindset. This is the misinformation that's not only coming from somebody like Donald Trump, who has all the power, but it's coming from media outlets like Fox, Newsmax, OAN, that are like crafting this narrative. And so... I love finding the comedy in that. I love going to places and seeing what people actually think, actually being there. But at some point, I do feel like it's important for people to see that uh, it's not just one crazy guy in the Oval Office. Uh, this, this point of view spreads, it's out there, and it's become ideology, and it's become identity, and it's become an American identity that, that sometimes we have, to, we have to grapple with. And we're not just going to grapple with it through one election. So I'm going to ask a question that may be controversial, but I want to know who sucks up to Trevor the most amongst all of you. And does that really get more of your pieces on the air, Desi? Uh, uh, <laughs> Why me? Who me? I just have to say, I think what Trevor is doing during this moment in time is just unbelievable. No one can start a conversation like Trevor Noah. I have never seen talent or intellect like that ever before in my life. And uh, I am looking for a raise right about now. <laughs> tough. So. No, seriously, I, I did want to ask you though. Um, <laughs> I, I love the pieces that you do, that you've done about Fox News, both the <clears throat> Fox explaining and, you know, talking to your aunt Janine Pirro. Um, <laughs> And, and, and it seems like Fox News is kind of in an interesting, uh, it, it's at an interesting point now. It's at a kind of a, it's having a crisis of identity. It's got two major competitors for the first time. What, what's your sense about where that is going and what kind of comedy do you think you, you maybe can mine from that? I, I don't know. I'm very curious to see what they do from here on out, how Fox shifts its narrative. I think in a way they might get crazier because they've got to compete. So I don't, I mean, I don't think Fox News is going anywhere um, in terms of like, you know, the, the, the spinning the crazy narratives and, and yeah, I, I know that they've got some, some competition lurking, but um you know, my conservative family members don't know how to find those channels, but they do know how to find Fox News. So right. I think there's still a base there. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm very interested in all of that and seeing how it plays out. You know what it feels like? It feels like when MTV expanded to M MTV2. And so like, <laughs> it's like MTV is where like the older Gen Xers went and MTV2 yeah, yeah, yeah. was, was the wilder, crazy, like ESPN2, <laughs> like any, it's like, that's what OAN, that's what those networks feel like. They feel like the, whoa, that's really extreme. And yeah. I just think yeah. that that's probably, you know, to Clifford's point about Trumpism, he's created competition for Fox News. Like, that's that's unheard of. Uh, Dulce, I wanted to ask you, I mean, once again, we're in this moment where uh, Black women have saved us from oblivion. And, uh, you know, have we shown the appropriate thanks to Stacey Abrams and Kamala Harris and, and AOC for pulling us back from the, the brink of oblivion the way they have? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and you never will. You never can. That's just, true. No. Kamala, we give her her flowers as often as we can. Stacey Abrams from my home state. We, we try what we can. But at the end of the day, it's 
stop looking for us to, to pull us out. That's mm. the thing that is like, because I did the piece about, you know, black women in Alabama saving them. And now we're talking about, oh, black women did this and black women did that. Because there's plenty of people looking at black women to save them, but they're not doing anything to not put themselves in that situation in the first place. Also, what benefit do we get for saving? Who's right. helping us? Exactly. Because it's, if y'all want to thank black women for saving somebody, you need to have justice for Breonna Taylor. That's what you need to do. Thank you. And for Sandra Bland. That's what needs to happen. Stop putting us in these situations. Quit making us save y'all. It's like, I always, it's like, I don't want to be Superman. Stop making me, mm -hmm. quit getting tied to the side of a building, okay? Quit messing <laughs> with these super villains. Quit being in danger and I don't have to help you, dumb dumb. <laughs> like, it's, and it's a, it's a weird place where it's just like, you know, black women saved us again. It's just like, we didn't do it for you. We saved ourselves. You, you were, you just got the collateral benefit. I didn't wake up being like, oh, how can I make sure that everybody else is more okay than me once right. again? That's insane. We didn't do that. We stopped the child molester from being in office in Alabama because he was a monster. That's what we did. We go to get people out to vote. We've been doing all of these things the whole time. We're just finally not getting recognition for it. But we're not waking up. I didn't wake up and put hair and makeup on to hope that Costa did well in this interview. I don't care. <laughs> Dang, a broadside to Costa from like nowhere. <laughs> we were joking about this uh, earlier, but you guys are the most diverse uh, late night show. And um... <laughs> never forget that that Michael Costa does have an NAACP nomination. You I'm serious. He does? Oh. Look, does. I'm My not brother. being sarcastic. <laughs> he was look the first person every... to hang his up. He was like, "Don't say, look, we got." I was like, "What did we get?" He's like, ah, and he was so happy to show me. As a young junior tennis champion, I never thought I would be nominated by the NAACP, and I am. <laughs> but look at every look at every late night show. It, it's all the same point of view. That is genuinely what is so unique about us. Any story, you close your eyes and you point to a newspaper and you get an article, we got somebody who can cover it. That's amazing. Well, that's what I wanted to ask is, is if you could talk a little bit about how you guys talk about issues differently because you have so much diversity and, and, and because you're led by somebody like Trevor, who also uh, has experienced a lot and has talked a lot about uh, his, his cultural diversity. It kind of funnels down to who we think would have the best voice for it. Because when there's women's pieces, there's me and Desi. When there's, you know, black pieces, there's me and Roy. When we have to yell at the conservatives of America, there's, uh, you know, Desi, Costa, and Klepper. But I think what we have done is that when there's a story, it's not always, here's the Black story, Roy Dulce Jabuki, go. Sometimes it's, what's the best way to tell it from a comedic angle? Who is the best person to tell it from a comedic angle? Because a lot of times, because sometimes we'll have stories and, you know, it'll get pitched with one correspondent. And when we look at it, it's, oh, you know what? We should change the correspondent on that. It should be, you know, Desi instead of Roy who who does this who does this interview, because sometimes it's not always the obvious choice isn't always the funniest choice. Right. And you know, Trevor, when I first got there, you know, Trevor was telling us when it comes to ideas for pitches, it was he said, look at the obvious thing. Now look at the exact opposite side of it or the side that you don't agree with. And a lot of times that opposite side, you can find more comedy in that than you can find with, oh, that's the obvious, you know, oh, there's people doing it. Then whoever, that's gonna be a perfect fit. So I think what we do is as much as we are diverse and we're telling, I think it's we're telling diverse stories mm -hmm. and we're able to tell diverse stories because we have a diverse group of people, but we're still thinking about who's the best person to tell this story. And I think also, not just from a comedic standpoint, but also from the people that we're interviewing, who are they going to be most comfortable with? Because if you're gonna be more open with a particular correspondent, then that's more places to mind comedy. You know, Dulce just did a segment last month on the AKAs and their relationship with Kamala and Black, Greek, you know, Ain't nobody else more qualified to talk to black women about a black woman's sorority than the black woman, you know, and if Dulce's busy, I, 
maybe be a Jabuki. Or we <laughs> do it with Desi and you flip it to that same, to that opposite that Trevor was right. talking about. But, right. you know, I just think we also are in a time where people are becoming a little more, people, viewers are becoming more conscious about who is telling their story and who is attempting to champion their voice. So I think that's something that it's 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 part of figuring out who goes out the door and i'm not going to say that that's a the most important prevalent part but it's in the back of your head as well because if you have jabuki sitting right there there's no reason why i should be touching the lgbtq story unless there's a specific reason creatively that it makes sense for me over jabuki so it's that part of it i think that's where the diversity really gives us a leg up on we can send anybody and anybody can be comfortable talking to us as well that's why we send Klepper to the rallies to talk to all the white men. And not me. <laughs> Michael, I did, I, did, I did want to ask you, you know, uh, you sort of inherited. Finally. Yeah, exactly. You sort of inherited the goofy white guy slot <laughs> that, that we saw get handed down from like Colbert to Ed Helms to Rob Riggle. Jordan even had it for a little while, I think. Yeah, I'm show. coming back. I'm coming back for it. I, I can't let go. I need it. I need it. I need it. Give me Goofy fight, White fight. Guy. If, if Goofy White Guy helps you get the career of those four people you just mentioned, <laughs> I'm fine with that. But I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a guarantee. But I, I think it's great that the show has kind of created a space where you can sort of talk about white cluelessness in a way. And it seems like you, you, you've done that. Jordan's done that. Can you talk a little bit about um, finding that space on a show um, where, again, you know, we've talked about this, kind of the diversity and how you guys um, pride yourself on being able to address yeah. a bunch of different subjects. Well, I think it works because I probably don't think I am that clueless. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a little bit like, oh, I can't be this clueless. But then as I read some of the words, I'm like, I did think that once. Or twice. <laughs> right. um, yeah. So uh, I look, there's a lot about the white male stereotype that I fit, but also I would love that I would love to make fun of. And I am sure everybody in reference to their gender, their sexual orientation and their race, there are parts of those things that they also think deserve to be ridiculed. So for me to wear a full Windsor knotted tie and talk about how rich white kids should get preferential treatment when applying to college, really? um, that is funny. And by talking about that in a serious tone it, through my character, it 100% points out that it's ridiculous. Um, and it's fun. You know, I think it's fun. Do sometimes people show up to my stand up shows on the road and go, hey, that's not the guy we saw on The Daily Show. What's <laughs> why can't you do that skit? And I go, well, you know, that isn't actually me. Sometimes that happens. But I get to tell jokes to a camera prior to pandemic uh, with Emmy Award winning performers, writers, producers. It is like comedy Ph.D. school. So. Uh, if I get to play the guy that gets kicked in the nuts six times in a row in one sketch, I'm okay with that because they don't always put me in that role. And, um, you know, I also get to pitch things about why I think the Great Lakes are important. And they are kind enough to send me to Toledo, Ohio and do a whole piece about how Lake Erie should have a Bill of Rights and actually have the same rights as a person and, and has become a person legally. So I get to do some serious stuff and I also get to do the, uh, oh my God, I just threw up in my mouth and swallowed it again piece, which is fine. <laughs> well, and, and I was interested in that idea of finding your voice as a correspondent. What was that process like? And is there ever a point when you sort of feel like you're there, like you, like you kind of know what your voice is on the show? I used to be really angry early on <laughs> and i and i i wonder if that was just a remnants of my stand-up comedy seeping into my role as a correspondent but like mm -hmm. even my first piece i was angry about them saying we're going to mars like why are you <laughs> angry about that like it's, right, right. With, with the premise being you're not going to let anybody go to mars because people can't get apartments on earth so you can't quite but it was just ah, 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 ah. right and when you look at the ship that, when you look at the way Trevor restructured the Daily Show tonally um, after John, there is a place for anger, but anger has to have a purpose. And so it took me, 
it's about a year or two to not let anger be the driving emotion through a piece. And you could find the things that are incredulous. You can find the stuff that's outrageous. Everyone is mad about this. So me joining you and being angry isn't always going to be the best way to inform and educate and present again, like Dulce said, flip it to the other side and show a different way through the topic. And that's where you're able to find a lot of new comedy. And, you know, I think that behind a lot of anger is hurt. So if you can find hurt, you can usually tap into what people are feeling without matching their level of screaming and yelling. I, I feel when I, when I joined the show back in the day, pretty under John, pretty classic correspondent rule, which like it's irony. I'm this heightened, dumb white guy version and irony is the number one thing you have in your tool belt. And I think what's been interesting over the last five-ish years, uh, one like Trevor came in as did Donald Trump, as did like a seismic change in a bunch of stuff. And like over the course of, like Trevor had more interest in bringing your own personality to that thing. So like a uh, straight irony wasn't playing as much partially because that felt a little bit dated, partially because Donald Trump was hyperbole in and of itself. So it was hard to out Trump Trump. Uh, and, 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 and you, you felt that skill set and the correspondence sort of shift. And, you know, I, I went away and I played a, a high, high concept character at one point, and then also did shows as myself. And I feel like even now, like coming back and doing stuff on the show, like you still play with irony. You still play with being the dumb white guy and that character that is there. But I think because like Donald Trump has stripped people away of their BS and now you're just versions of yourself in some way. And so I think that's part of that is what's really fun to play too. It's like, I see myself going to rallies now and it's, it's not that I'm some dummy talking ironically. I can use that tool here and there, but more often than not, what people respond to is like, they see yourself within that character because that's kind of where comedy is right now, is we want to see authenticity, even if you are using other comedic tools. You have to be able to show them what your point of view is underneath and not just live so far away from what the, the point of view that person who's experienced it might be. That makes sense. And, and Jordan, I got to say, man, uh, I, I, I have all the respect for you because I love that interview you did with Adam Schiff or uh, where you got him to say bat shit on camera like that like that was this is, you know a lot of a lot of seasoned journalists have tried to get powerful people to swear but uh what you do is if you stand out in the cold uh and you really go at somebody for long enough with stupid questions you will get them to swear and then you will put that on comedy central <laughs> And you will earn your health insurance for a week. So that's beautiful. I hope so. I, I hope so. <laughs> so um, Yellow so Cross, is that a thing? They sent me something for Yellow Cross. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm hoping that's a thing. Is is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll get back to you on that. So uh, but I did I did want to ask you guys too, um, and this is something that we talked about before we started. Um, you've been doing this for a while now without an audience. And I wonder, um, do, you, do you see things eventually getting back to the point where you get to have a studio audience? And are there things that you've learned from this pandemic experience that maybe you think you could retain, you could keep doing, even if you get back to the point where you're in a studio and, and you're performing for a crowd again? I do think, you know, we will eventually get back to the point where we can be with our audience and be back in the studio. We have no idea when that's going to be, obviously. But um, but one interesting thing that's happened in this period of time is, is I think the show overall has been able to take uh, more risks with certain jokes. You can go a little bit darker. You can go at something with a different pace. You can take chances that you might not be able to otherwise in front of the audience because you don't know how they're going to react. Or you might have to time something in such a way that you know that the audience is going to have this reaction. And I think like creatively, I know the writers have had a lot of fun with that. I think Trevor's having a lot of fun with that. It it This version of the show tonally is is different and and it's kind of a cool creative exploration uh in in a way and and i think some of those risks might kind of continue throughout even when we do go back into the studio we might be able to still kind of play around with that y'all are scared of like your timing being off when you get back in studio because like when we first started instinctively i'm like pausing for a laugh or and i'm like oh wait we're not performing a conversation 
I'm just having a conversation with Trevor. So stylistically now for like, we're basically, we're at a year now at this point of no audience. And like my fear is that the moment we go back with an audience, I'm just gonna start talking to Trevor again. And the crowd is laughing. I'm just like, shut up, we're talking. And like, that's, that's my biggest fear. It's like how this will alter us as a performer. I gotta get back out on stage and do stand up at some point so I can. I mean, I was pretty used to performing jokes and not having a lot of laughter. So for me, <laughs> this felt very comfortable. You know how Olympic swimmers will train in like four bathing suits and then when the Olympic meet comes up, they just wear one bathing suit so they feel faster. I feel like this is our four bathing suit wearing time. You know, we're like <laughs> performing comedy for nobody. And even though there, even though there is somebody and we're thankful that there's people watching, but it fe there's no immediate feedback. Um, and if there is immediate feedback, and if one of your takes was so hilarious, all you hear is a delayed Zoom response from the producer that says, okay, let's do that again. <laughs> so um, I'm looking forward to the audience coming back in 2039, and it's gonna kick butt, man. Well, you know, it's, it's weird. So as a, as a viewer, I thought I saw um, on, on the show a different way of cutting segments, like a, a faster sort of editing technique uh, to make up for the fact that you, you didn't have people uh, laughing and, and and reacting anymore. And I was wondering, is that was that something, uh, did that happen? Did, did, did you have a sense that maybe even the editing style of the show changed a little bit to uh, get to the jokes quicker because you didn't have an audience? It, de I, it definitely, it so. did. yeah, yeah, it definitely um, felt like, especially with Trevor, like I noticed their progression changed successfully, you know, and I, I think you're right to pick up on that, Eric. I don't know if it was a decision, but look, The Daily Show does not stop creating comedy. And it is, it is evolving and progressing and adjusting and moving every single day. Uh, and that's what they do well. And I'll let the others answer. When I say I didn't know, I don't know if it was a flat out decision made. Cause it's like, I don't, I don't even know where the editors are right now because no one's in the studios. So I don't know where these cats are at. <laughs> but I can say that for me, I don't know if a decision was made, but I can say that it does feel different. And because like with the field pieces, it's kind of been it, the way we interview is different because um, it's talking through a screen as opposed to being in person. But watching Trevor, I think because I've done, you know, doing the show for this long, and you know, being a comedian, you still feel where the laughs are. So even you're not, even though I don't he audibly hear an audience, and he's not like pausing. It's I can feel as a comic, and like you know, watching the show, and it's like, oh, there's the laugh, there's the laugh. Because sometimes I laugh in between, <laughs> but you can still feel the jokes, and you can still feel what's hitting, and it still feels like it's hitting the same. Cause like for us, we watch for like, you know, when we're in the studio, we watch rehearsal. So a lot of times it's, we would only, if we heard laughs, it'd be just a few of the crew guys anyway. Right. Um, so I think sometimes when I watch the show, I always treat it like I'm watching rehearsal. Mm. And it's like, I could feel where the laugh is. Honestly, so it just goes go, oh, there's no audience. So I don't have that <laughs> thought anymore. It was, oh, I'm just watching rehearsal. It's just like watching rehearsal. Yes, he's in his house in a hoodie, but that's fine. It's fine. <laughs> So that's how I kind of treat think, it. It's just, yeah, ah, it's just rehearsal. It's good. I think that the thing that's like really evident with Trevor specifically is that there's a lot more camera turns and there's a lot more graphic overlays. And it sounds crazy to say, but it's easy to add that type of stuff in this setup than it is in a studio setup. In turn, like something like when they had the, um, like the, the cat lawyer joke or like Trevor had blues clues on his face. Like it was just as simple as just adding a filter in post. And so those types of things, it's just, again, you're doing comedy in a box. So anything you can add, if it's a camera turn, I love the fact that we still take shots at Spirit Airlines. Like those things <laughs> somehow Always. still remain in the show. But I don't think that those things inherently yeah, I don't think that creatively these are comedic vehicles that we would have explored right away in studio because in studio you have so much more higher tech stuff available. It would have been a full conversation about a Blue's Clues graphic build out and 
comedy d sketch and it, it like, no, just I'm gonna turn this way. You're gonna put a Blue's Clues dog on my face, just like the Snapchat TikTok filters. Everybody gets it because we're all living in the same world from a technical standpoint. So certain jokes that would be considered simple in the pre-COVID times are on par with the way everyone consumes information now. I think the audience adds so much energy to the show also in the past, like being able to do it in front of a live audience. There's energy to that. There's momentum to that. So now we're sort of trying to get creative with infusing energy and pace and momentum into the show that, we, that we're not getting from the audience. So luckily we have really skilled editors who can quicken the pace. You can do camera turns and, and take creative liberties. Um, to kind of make up for that. So it seems like we're getting close to the end of our time here. And I wanted to ask you guys, um, maybe a, a couple of you, if, if it comes to mind, what's your favorite bit that you've come up with during the pandemic sort of lockdown when you've been working from home? And, and, and if you think uh, in doing that bit, you learn something that you're gonna carry forward into the work that you're doing in the show in the future. Uh, I'll answer first so you guys can come up with something. What, one of my favorite pieces was this parody of a travel show that I did in my, I didn't, yeah, I did in my apartment. Uh, I was reluctant. If you can't tell, I'm reluctant a lot, Eric. Um, <laughs> You, know, I, you you were talking I, about being in a small apartment. After I saw that piece, I was like, you have a great apartment. Like, what do you yeah, I, and, and this is just the city house. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, Jordan, Jordan, you might want to have your people talk to Michael Costa. Yeah. yeah, you have two houses. Do they both have health care? <laughs> <laughs> that was literally opening the door of my home to our viewers. And my you know initial reluctance was was met with a lot of positive feedback about the piece. It was really funny. And also I was like, hey, hey, old man winter over here. Maybe comedy's different now. Maybe you have to show a little bit of your home. <laughs> Maybe you're gonna have to set a tripod and a camera up in your bathroom. I'm definitely one that likes to stay in the comfort zone. And, and what I've learned in my three years, four years of The Daily Show now is they will take me out of the comfort zone and they will do so successfully. You know, I, I sometimes am reluctant to do it, but I like that piece because it showed that we can produce funny comedy with serious comedic handcuffs on right now. And they're continuing to do that. And I'm really proud of that. I had a similar off of what Costa said. I, I too felt reluctant about the fact that, you know, we're shooting in our house and everything feels so personal and you can see my bedroom in the background and I've got my kid running around and my dog is over in the corner. And, you know, it, there was one piece that I did with, we were interviewing a, a family doctor right at the beginning of COVID, right at the beginning of the lockdown. And my four-year-old at the time was at home. School was not in session. We were doing homeschool and my husband was on a work call and my son walked into the room during the interview and I had no choice but to just kind of go with it <laughs> and use it. So it, it, it ended up being something that we used in the piece and we've continued to dip into from time to time. If, if there's an, an interruption, it's like, you know what, it's going to happen. Let's just go with it. And I ended up hearing from some of my parent friends that were like, oh my God, I love that moment when he came in. My kid does that all the time when I'm on the phone. And it's just like, you know, there's an intimacy and a, um, it feels there's something about recording right now that just feels more personal. Um, and that never would have happened in the studio. Yeah. And I have this feeling that some of that is going to retain that, that we're going to see. Yeah. I, I will definitely, I will definitely continue to use my child as a crutch in, in comedy. <laughs> I've actually started to use Desi's child as a comedic crutch as well. So yep. yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you go to the professionals, right? Roy? At the beginning of quarantine, I tried to cut my son's hair. <laughs> and it was very terrible. It was very terrible. And he told me it was terrible. And he's four. And even at four, he knew a terrible haircut when he seen one. And so we ended up kind of, I ended up kind of taking that life moment and then rolling that into a segment where I just got on the phone with my barber and 
we did a segment where I just tried to learn how to cut my hair at home. And that was the surface level of it. But then you kind of dig into how much the beauty shop and the black barber shops, because black people and because of the issues of mental health, we're not having the health care to even be able to afford mental health, how important barbers are. And there were a lot of bar there are a lot of barbers who just get calls from their clients, even though they couldn't come into the shop because they still missed that connection. So that was the one piece that I think I've done at home that I think was the most birth from something that I'm actually going through on a rate. Like to Desi's point about, you know, I heard I almost said your child's real name, but see, I ain't give it away because I don't want them people to know. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Roy. To the point with Desi's child, Tyrone, often walking <laughs> into the, the room, um, you know, like it's, it's cool to be able to take these little things that are happening in your life and go, well, if it's happening to me, it's probably happening to somebody else. And this wasn't some bigger issue that's tackling the thing and the politician and we're going to take you down and pass the referendum. No, I just don't know how to cut my hair. And it turns out clients miss their barber too. So let's talk to a barber. I've, I've found, uh, when, when you go and do field pieces before all this happened, it's such a bond between the, the producers, the performer, the sound guy, the two camera guys, you all, you're, you're a team and you collectively go and you travel to these places. And now during quarantine, that's all different. And what I've found is the last few pieces I've had to do, I go solo alone in my car and it is <clears throat> wonderful. It's just <laughs> yeah. me, I put on like, Bob Dylan albums that my wife will never let me play, like yeah. 80s Bob Dylan that yeah. nobody wants to hear, and I just zone out, and it is perfect. And when this all gets back to normal, I will not travel with anybody I work with. I will yeah. be alone, <laughs> and I will. Cameraman I will just be Joel's out. not. Cameraman Joel's not trying to have you drink some mushroom coffee. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I miss Joel's yeah. mushroom oh, coffee. Joel's got mushroom coffee. Joel don't cheese. understand how that coffee works. Oh. Make you but that's I why thought you were crazy. joking when you said that. That's a thing. No, that's a real oh thing. Oh my god! Oh my god! But I Joel's, a, wonder, like Joel's a wonderful man, but you gotta you, alone in a car is so lovely. You gotta try it. It's but it's just, not it's, drug it's, mushrooms. I think they're just regular ass <laughs> mushrooms. Yeah, no, they're not the good mushrooms. He's not even high. He's just no. drinking fungus. I mean, he is, but not from no, the. He's not, upset he's not high from the tea. <laughs> The tea actually brings him down. Actually, I think the tea is what sobers him up a little bit. Oh, okay. He was telling me about mushroom coffee, and I just went, I'm okay. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> I want to thank the correspondents for The Daily Show for joining us for this special South by Southwest panel. The Daily Show news team, content from their couches, not their bathrooms, their couches. Many thanks to Desi Lyle, Jordan Klepper, Michael Costa, Dulce Sloan, and Roy Wood Jr. Uh, guys, I had so now much fun. On, Eric, I could talk Eric. to you for like two hours. Uh, Eric, before we wrap real quick, Dulce, one to ten. Right, Eric's background. He got a lot of plaques, yeah, got a go. lot of degrees, oh, a lot of books no. back there. One okay, to ten. Okay, let's see what we got one. going on here. All right, one, you got a little flexy because you wanted us to know that you wrote a book. Problem is this book cannot be purchased by everybody unless they get put on a list. Kind of like you know, the professor at Harvard who wrote the book and it was the title just the N word. Sir, we need to keep tabs on who bought that damn book. Also, they had to put your picture next to it for a reason. I see a plaque of some sort. I see framed, nice. I see framed art. Accomplished. Um, so I see you accomplished. I see some type of article in a frame of some type of certificate below it. I don't know if you earned something or you own a sip and paint. That could have easily happened. I see a lot of <laughs> books that are vertical and horizontal. This is one of them bookcases where it's just like, listen, I read books, but like, I don't want to be like a bookcase guy. So <laughs> I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a strong eight. I'm going to give it a strong eight. The color scheme is not that great. <laughs> No, thank you guys so much, man. I, I am fans of all of you. This was uh, a, a treat, the highlight of my week for sure. Thank you guys so much. 